and my name is Mary Helen Imordino Yang. I'm an affective neuroscientist and an educational psychologist at the University of Southern California. And I study the ways in which children's emotional and social relationships shape their learning and also shape the brain development that undergirds their learning so that they can learn better into the future. And I'm going to start my talk with a picture of my children's jack-o'-lanterns from a few years ago. And the reason is that I think that the jack-o'-lantern is a really fantastic visual metaphor for how children learn. Inside of each one of those little pumpkins is a fire burning, a fire that consumes oxygen and that shines out through that child's actions and through that child's um, beliefs and through that child's learning in the world. And, you know, historically we've thought, and scientists even thought, that emotions interfere with clear-headed thinking, that in order to learn well, we needed to get our emotions out of our thought, we needed to take ourself out of it, we needed to take our feelings out of it, and instead just focus in a kind of pure way on the cognitive skill that we're trying to develop. And what we're learning with our new neuroscientific research is that nothing could be further from the truth in the way that human brains actually learn. And this makes good sense evolutionarily because the ordinary purpose of our brain is to keep us alive. It's to steer our actions and our thoughts and behaviors so that we remember the things that matter, so that we learn the things that we think are going to need in the future and we don't attend to or spend a lot of time thinking about the stuff that we think doesn't matter or that we think is not important. To demonstrate what I mean, I have a little poem written by a kindergartner about her baby brother named Theodore. She calls him Teddy. And you can see a little picture of her up here with her little pink dress and crayon. And underneath, she's written out her poem. And it says, oh, Teddy, we love you more than the whole earth size. As the earth spins every day, we love you as much as usual, but sometimes even more as you make us proud and happy that you're you. I have a simple question for you. Is that a poem about this little girl's love for her baby brother? Or is that a poem about her budding knowledge of planetary science? <laughs> our emotions and our relationships and our cultural experiences in the social world literally organize and shape the development of brain networks that allow us to learn. Over the course of the morning, you're going to hear from my colleagues about their work describing how children's identities, how children's emotional experiences in the learning environments they're exposed to are influencing what they're capable of doing. And I want you to take this information very seriously because this isn't just sort of a, a, a recent fad about how people learn to make people happier or something like that. This is literally shaping and changing and recruiting brain networks for memory and emotion that will not be recruited any other way. It is literally neurobiologically impossible to think about things deeply or to remember things about which you've had no emotion. I'm going to show you next a picture of the human brain in an inspired learning state. And the orange dots, the orange spots that appear on this brain in a moment represent the places in a person's brain where there is statistically more blood flowing, reliably more neural activity and firing when people are learning information that they find inspirational, that they're telling us in the moment makes them deeply reflective about what it means, about who they are, and about how they're going to use that information in the future, as compared to when they're learning things that don't feel inspirational to them, that feel sort of detached and not that relevant or not that important. And what I want you to notice is that not only are there massive orange activations, huge areas and swaths of activation up at the level of the cortex, all this folded up stuff at the top that we're so proud of having so much more of than apes, right? But that actually inspired learning activates all the way to the bottom of the field of view of our scanner. If you look in the middle of this image, there's a kind of a white stalk 
that heads down. That's your brain stem. That part of our brain we share with all vertebrates. Alligators have a gorgeous one of these, right? <laughs> and we've thought over time that inspired learning is involving only these high level, complex networks for thinking about and deliberating on information. But in fact, what happens is that the outcome of those deliberations is literally feeding itself down all the way into the brainstem mechanisms that keep you alive. Those Regions in the middle of that brainstem and all the way to the bottom control things like consciousness. Like literally, if you damage them, you get coma. And at the very bottom, that orange spot at the very bottom in what we call the medulla is just above that little thread of spinal cord. If you get damaged there, we cannot even keep you alive on life support. Your heart stops beating, you stop breathing, and your physiology becomes completely dysregulated. Think how powerfully this image speaks to the need to engage kids in a personal, emotional, deeply relevant, culturally situated way in their learning experiences. From the very beginning of our lives, we learn in cultural and emotional and socially subjective ways. We situate ourselves inside of relationships and those relationships are nested inside of bigger and bigger spheres of relationships that organize and influence the way in which we think and learn. We need to take our emotions and our relationships and our social situatedness extremely seriously if we want to actually build schools that support all children in learning optimally and in growing their brains optimally so that they're capable of thinking well into the future. Thank you.